Our second scripture comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? We observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, <coughs> until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. There are lots of unusual stories in the Bible. And this is one of the most unusual ones. To make it even more interesting as a preaching passage is, it's also one that is almost universally known, universally misunderstood, and universally remembered incorrectly. We all know the carol, We Three Kings, right? Well, you'll notice, you noticed in the passage I read, didn't say anything about kings. Now, in Greg's passage earlier, it talked about kings coming from foreign places. And, and somehow those two passages get conflated in people's minds so that these people coming to worship the babe must have been kings because it mentioned kings in Isaiah, even though here in Matthew we read about three wise men. If you had really paid attention, you would have also noticed it didn't say there were three of them. It just said, wise men from the east. Now, the word that was translated as wise men in the reading I had is a troublesome word. And indeed, if it got translated more accurately, many, especially more conservative Christians, would really, really have problems with it. Because it better translates than wise men as magicians, or astrologers, or even sorcerers. Some places it gets translated as scholars or wise men, but they were nothing like we would associate with scholar or wise men. Some translations just transliterate the word and tell us they were magi. Now, we put them in the history of the church, and there have been some Christian traditions where they were not seen as good guys, but literally as enemies of God. First, because of the condemnation of sorcery and astrology in the Old Testament. And then the fact that when they finally arrive, they go to Jerusalem, and the first place they go is to see Herod. And they tell Herod, we're here to worship 
the newborn king. And Herod, of course, sees that as a threat, and that endangers the life of the child Jesus. Now, the word magi usually referred to Zoroastrian priests. Back to the number, Zoroastrian priests almost always traveled and worked in groups of 12. So, good chance of that. Marco Polo, in his writing, said that when he was traveling to the east, he saw the tombs of the Magi who had visited the child Jesus outside of Tehran. Some other traditions have them coming from as far away as China. Now, most often in, in our tradition, they get portrayed as three of them, Balthazar, who came from North Africa, Melchior from Persia, and Gaspar from India. But nothing in the text identifies them in that way or says where they come from. Okay, more misunderstandings. You know that Cheryl and I collect uh, nativity sets from all over the world. Almost every single one of them has three wise men with their camels, standing at the manger, holding gifts. We learned a new carol this year, one that, except for this little part, I really, really like. Come darkness, come light, we sang it a couple of times. And in the chorus, it's got three wise men there at the manger. They look great in nativity sets. They might even sound great in songs. They weren't there at the birth of Jesus. The first place we see that is the Greek language has very distinct words for child and infant. And they are very literally different. You don't call an infant a child and you don't call a child an infant any more than we would call a teenager a toddler. And the word here that's used to describe Jesus is child, not infant. And when they arrive, they enter the home, not the stable. A careful reading seems also to indicate that the star appears when the child is born. These astrologers see this star from wherever they are. <coughs> Excuse me. And they, when they see the star, they immediately begin to make plans. But this is a big trip. It took a while to make those plans. They had to gather supplies. They had to figure out how many camels do we need? How many people are going to travel? We're going to need protection because we're going to be going in places where bad things can happen. So it took a while for them to gather the entourage they needed to get all of their supplies and then to travel. It literally would have been months, possibly more than a year, before they had arrived in Jerusalem to try to find this babe, this child. And that's further supported when they get there and Herod says, when did the star appear? They tell Herod when the star appears, and later on he decides he's going to have all of the male children under two years old, killed. Now, he probably was given a little bit of wiggle room there, but he was expecting the child Jesus to be close to two at this time. The next piece we get to is these gifts that seem mostly unusual to us. We can understand why Someone might give a gift of gold to a king, but frankincense and myrrh don't make a lot of sense to us. And many of us have heard sermons or, again, we go back to We Three Kings, and, and that song allegorizes the frankincense and myrrh and tells us that gold shows us that he was a king, frankincense somehow shows us that he was God, and myrrh predicts his death. And we've heard those sermons, many of us at least. And there are kind of hints to that. Frankincense was used 
as part of the incense in the temple at Jerusalem. And if you go to a church that specializes in smells and bells today, one of the things you will smell is frankincense. It's there. Um, myrrh was used by the Egyptians in embalming. But I think it really is a more simple explanation than that. Occam's razor says when you've got a more simple ex explanation, it's probably right. Well, in this case, frankincense was used by ordinary people as an offering at the temple. Myrrh was used in perfumes, in anointing oils, and it was thought to have medicinal properties. They were both good things to have. They were also hard to get in Palestine and very expensive. It's not unusual that such things, hard to get, expensive, useful, that's what you give to someone who's really important. So I don't think there was anything particularly symbolic about the gifts. It's just what they brought. It's not terribly different. Maybe you've seen the joke that's going around, goes around every Christmas, but it's been prolific this year, of what if it had been three wise women instead of three wise men? One would have brought diapers. <laughs> One would have bought a, a voucher for babysitting. You know. Okay. So we read this story and it's got all of this stuff that at least comes to me and I assume comes to you as well whenever you read it. And all of it's wrong. Then what in the world do we do with this story? Why in the world would I have chosen to preach on it today when I really love the Isaiah passage? Arise, shine, for your light has come. I could have run with that one and instead chose to fight against this. Well, the first piece is a reminder that anything the gospel writers tell us, they tell us for a reason. They don't put stories in there just because they're fun stories. They put the stories in that they put in because there's something they want us to know. There's something they want us to hear. And they leave things out because they're not important, or at least not important enough. This strange story is in the Bible because Matthew wanted his audience, and by extension us, to know something something he thought was important enough to take up this much space in his writings. Matthew's audience lived in a time of extreme religious diversity. We've heard about it a lot this week. There were these jokes going around about all of the different religious books that were used as the various uh, representatives were sworn in. There, were, there was a Baha'i Gita, there was a Thomas Jefferson's own copy of the Quran was there. There was a Bible. A couple of people used the Constitution. All of these different documents. And, and as, a, as an expression of the, the diversity in this country. And, and we think that we are really religiously diverse. But the reality was, in, Ma in Matthew's time, it was much more so. Much more so. There were literally hundreds of different religions traveling around the Roman Empire at that time. And just like now, many of those religions promised truth and promised it exclusively. If you become a follower of Mithra, you will know the truth, and the truth will save you. And everybody else, they don't have it. Everybody else is missing the picture. All of these adherents of these various faiths believed that their faith had a unique and often exclusive connection to the divine. Now they may or may not have believed that uh, people who didn't agree with them were going to whatever their equivalent of hell was. Some did, some didn't. But they all believed that their faith was the way to salvation. Again, 
whatever that meant in their particular faith. But in this story, what we see are leaders of another religion or religions coming to worship a Jewish savior, which they do. But the, beyond that, we don't hear anything about it. They don't appear to convert. If they did, Matthew didn't think it was important enough to tell us. They come, they worship the child Jesus, they give their gifts, and they go home. We don't know anything else about them. We don't know that it caused any changes in their lives. We don't know that it caused any changes in how they worship, in what they believe, in what they do. Indeed, the way they, they uh, discover this child Jesus is in a way that's completely outside of the Jewish faith. They see a star. Astrology is condemned in the Old Testament. And God speaks to them. Now, there is a legend that tells that during those 20-some years, we don't know what went on in Jesus' life. There is a legend that says that part of what he did during that time was he went and searched through Asia to find these three wise men and studied them. But it doesn't appear in the Bible, and it's not even a prominent legend. Most Christian traditions didn't believe that or hold that. So essentially what happens is they come, they hear about, about this birth in, in a way that's pagan. They come and they worship, and they disappear, and we never hear from them again. Never hear from them again. Matthew told us what Matthew thought we needed to know. He didn't care what happened afterwards. It wasn't important enough to know how this impacted them afterwards. It's not an unreasonable explanation to think Nothing happened, really. They came, they worshipped, they encountered the presence of God, and they went home and continued to be good whatever they happened to be. Zoroastrians from Iran, Hindus from India, pagans from North Africa, maybe people who worship their ancestors from China. We don't know. We don't know. But the point is, that God had reached out to these practitioners of other faith, of another faith or other faiths, in a way that they understood and didn't call them to change. Reached out even to unclean pagans who look for messages in the stars. The gift of God comes even to these bunglers who almost get the child killed and are indirectly responsible for the deaths of scores of others and for causing the family of Jesus to flee as refugees trying to keep their child alive crossing into a foreign land. Again, the only conclusion that we can think is Matthew didn't think it was important for us to know what happens afterwards with these magi. So what in the world do we do with that? I, I've said before that Christianity is unique among world religions in that it speaks to people where they are in their own language. To follow Jesus, we don't have to learn the language Jesus spoke. If you want to be a good Jew, you go through your bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, you learn Hebrew. And you have to prove it by showing it. You read the passage at the, at, the, at the service to everybody present. If you want to be a good Muslim, you have to learn Arabic. Indeed, the Quran is not the Quran if it's not in Arabic. It is something else. It's a translation. It's a pointer. But it's not the Quran. The Quran is only in Arabic. 
most religions are like that. If you want to read the Hindu scriptures, you need to learn Sanskrit. Christianity, that's not the case. Indeed, most Christians in the world have no idea even what language Jesus spoke. If you would ask most people, they probably would answer, oh, uh, he, he must have spoken Hebrew. Well, he didn't. He spoke Aramaic. And I don't know about you, I don't know any Aramaic. And I don't think I have to. As Christians, we believe that God speaks to us in our language, in English, Greek, Spanish, Urdu, Chumash, and any of a thousand other languages. And the Bible for us is still scripture, regardless of what it's translated into. Even though there is that group that says, no, the only real Bible is the King James Version. That's the inspired one. <laughs> well, we don't believe that. We don't believe that at all. As Christians, we say part of the, of the genius of incarnation is that God comes to us where we are. And this week, as I've been thinking about this passage, I've been wondering if maybe this passage takes that idea even a step further. Maybe God doesn't only come to us in our language, the one we speak, but also in the paradigm of our worldview, which includes our religious understandings. The implications of that are, are, are deep and radical, and I'm not even going to go with all of those. We're not going to take that time today. Except to say that to the degree that that is true, if God is also speaking to those whose language and whose paradigm of reality, whose understanding, whose religious traditions are different than ours, if God is speaking to them, even Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and even atheists, then we have something to learn from them. We have something to learn from them. At the very least, with these magi, we learn, hey, God did speak to them through a star. It's not doesn't necessarily mean we have to go and all get our charts done. But maybe it means that we can experience God in the nature around us. And maybe there's something to learn there that we need to learn as Christians. If God speaks through to all of these other folk where they are, maybe they have something that they can teach us that we need to learn if we want to really be the best followers of Jesus that we can be, if we want to get a com more complete and more clear picture of who God is and what God's yearnings are for the world, we need to be open to this interfaith gathering that happened in this house with Mary and Joseph and this group of leaders from some other faith. At the very least, we have no room to ever judge someone else who is trying to find their path to God, which may or may not be very similar to our own. It may just be that God is speaking to them in ways we don't understand or see. I think it's important that one of the very first stories Matthew tells us is of an interfaith gathering. Maybe that's someplace where we need to be putting some of our time and some of our energy. Getting to see where God has spoken and how God has spoken to folk who experience the divine in ways that are different from you. Mm -hmm.